I made a hefty dent in my reading goal in January, but not a hefty dent in my physical to read pile, and they're supposed to be aligned, so I tried. At least I'm reading. Okay, here we go. Number one, Scott Pilgrim, Volume 1, Scott Pilgrim's Precious Little Life by Brian Lee O'Malley. I gave 4.5 out of 5. With the release of the new animated series, I wanted to reread these. I was always disappointed that the movie didn't align with the books fully, so this will help me overly compare the books to the new series as well. We're introduced to Scott in this one, his bandmates, his newest obsession, Ramona, and his high school girlfriend, Knives. It's so weird how everyone was like, oh cool, yeah, Mr. 23-year-old, date the 17-year-old. At least it has the unrealistic touch of him not forcing himself sexually onto her, but he does cheat on her. What the hell is that? Let's ruin this child's trust for the rest of her life. And they paint her like she's crazy. Excuse me? This is what happens when a grown man dates a child. She's not crazy, you're breaking her. I'm complaining a lot for a book that I rated so high. I just needed to get that off my chest. I do love this series. It's kind of funny when the main character is the least likable, yet the series still manages to suck you in. The sarcasm is too good, and it's my kind of humor. What else can I say? Maybe the plot. Scott now wants to date Ramona and has to defeat her seven evil exes. They agree to be in a relationship even though he's still in one with knives because he's an asshole. And they get through their first evil ex, Matthew Patel. Number 2, Scott Pilgrim, Volume 2, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World by Brian Lee O'Malley. I gave 4 out of 5. Scott cheats on Knives some more and finally breaks up with her. She hops on over to young Neil, who is also an inappropriate age because Scott broke this child and now she doesn't know any better. Scott has the attention span of a puppy and gets all obsessed when his ex, Envy Adams, calls and they all go to her show where they find out the bass player in her band is Ramona's third evil ex. Early in the book, he already defeated Luke, the second ex. Ramona calls a lot of things retarded, and when that word is used so casually, my brain in 2024 is smacked with shock. It's so jarring now. Her and Scott also have no chemistry. I don't understand the love story in this series. I still love the humor, though, so it still gets a high rating from me. 3. Scott Pilgrim, Volume 3, Scott Pilgrim and the Infinite Sadness by Brian Lee O'Malley. I gave 4 out of 5. This volume focuses on Envy and Scott's backstory and his fight with her current boyfriend, aka Ramona's third evil ex. All my statements stay the same for this one, only now they're shitting on vegans. I do think the vegan power thing is funny, but I feel like they pushed it a teensy bit too far for my liking. I'm probably just jealous because it's been 17 years and my vegan powers still haven't kicked in yet. 4. Scott Pilgrim, Volume 4, Scott Pilgrim Gets It Together by Brian Lee O'Malley. I gave 3.5 out of 5. Here we focus on Scott's old friend who he almost cheats on Ramona with, while Ramona actually cheats on Scott with her ex-lady lover, who's actively trying to kill him. Why has everyone got to be cheaters here? Knives' dad also tries to kill Scott, but stands down. Knives and Kim make out. That might have been in Volume 3, I don't remember, but these 20-somethings need to stop making out with this poor 17-year-old. They're all just passing around the child. Stop. Everyone in this series is kind of horrible, but I just love the pacing of it so much. 5. Scott Pilgrim Volume 5, Scott Pilgrim vs. the Universe by Brian Lee O'Malley. I gave 3.5 out of 5. Scott defeats Ramona's twin exes and finds out that she cheated on them with each other, so his cheating brain thinks that means it's okay that he cheated on her and knives with each other. Side note though, how fucked up is it to not only cheat, but to cheat with the person's twin? It's just taking cheating to a whole other level. 6. Scott Pilgrim, Volume 6, Scott Pilgrim's Finest Hour by Brian Lee O'Malley. I gave 5 out of 5. Such a perfect ending. I forgot how great they wrapped up this series. Everyone realizes what they were doing wrong and work to fix it while the full story is still being fast-paced and hilarious. I love it so much and recommend forever. After finishing my reread of the comic book series, I did watch the Netflix animated series, and they made it even further from the book series. I just, I can't win here. Number 7, The Woman in Me by Britney Spears. I gave 4.5 out of 5. I started this in November, and the library digitally snagged it from me several hours early when I only had a few chapters left. So it's no longer super fresh in my memory. I didn't know that she was almost cast in The Notebook. I love her in Crossroads, but can you imagine the notebook without Rachel McAdams? Luckily, things worked out in the end. 
Brittany says here that acting was so hard on her because she couldn't keep herself separate from the characters. At least she realized that and stepped away from acting. Her life story is kind of sad. She lost her virginity way too young, was drinking alcohol supplied by her own mother too young. She was tortured by paparazzi, a job that should be illegal. She was cheated on by Justin so many times, but was shamed for being a slut when she cheated back. I think cheating is bad even as retaliation, but I also think when cheaters cheat, they create more cheaters. What Justin did was way worse. I'm not going to sit here and list all of the tragedies. You should check out the book, but I did want to add that she was my first concert two decades ago, and it's disheartening to read that during the tour I caught, she was praying to break something so she could stop, and soon after my city, she did get hurt, and the rest of the tour got canceled. That experience was so special to me, and I had no idea that she was suffering. It's a bummer. I'm glad she's free now. I hope she can heal. The Free Britney chapter had me in tears. I'm glad she feels us supporting her. Number 8, Wonka, by Not Raw Dull. I gave 1.5 out of 5. I'm just annoyed that I wasted my time with this. When I saw it for pre-order from the library, I jumped in line because it specifically said that it was written by Roald Dahl. So I thought it was a long-lost edition of the original, but no, no, no. It's just the movie as a book. Is it just to be inclusive to the vision and hearing impaired? Because if that's it, I get it. Is it to share a character's thoughts? I don't know. I had already seen the movie, though, so I didn't need to also read this, and I'm annoyed that the library advertised it as Roald Dahl himself. Number 9, Rising Stars Compendium by J. Michael Straczynski. I gave 4 out of 5. I read the first half of this beast of a book in fall, so I don't remember much of that half. It's an interesting series. Since this is the compendium, there's probably about 100 single issues compiled here, and every three to six issues tell a different story about one of the specials, which are people from a group around 100 people that have special abilities. I didn't love all of the storylines, but a lot were really interesting, so I'd still recommend this. Number 10. The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Volume 1, by Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill. I gave 3 out of 5. I just read this and I already can't remember what happened. I didn't even know as I read it. I just knew that I neither loved it nor hated it. It takes place around the year 1900, and there's a group of people including a woman and an invisible man. There's a few sexist comments and references to Mariarty from Sherlock Holmes, and that's about all I got from it, so I have no idea if I'd recommend it. Number 11, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Century 1910, by Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill. I gave 2 out of 5. In this story, they try capturing a killer, but once they do, they set him free because someone else admits to it even though they know that they had the right guy originally. It makes no sense, and it got a little rapey. They don't outright say it, but some women are naked when they're being saved, so one can assume. Not a fan, and still don't really understand the series. Number 12, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Volume 2, by Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill. I gave 1 out of 5. I actually almost like this one, but then this beast guy told a woman he should rape her. He doesn't, but still. And later, that woman convinces a very old man to fuck her, and it's graphically shown multiple times. When I read comics, I don't want erotica, and I especially don't want mentions of rape. I don't recommend this series, and this is where I'm leaving it for now, until I forget that I didn't enjoy it and go for volume 3, which I hope doesn't happen, but you never know. Number 13, Sukoden 3. No idea if I'm saying that right. The Successor of Fate, Volume 1 by Aki Shimizu. I gave 4 out of 5. Hugo is a young boy who finds and loves a griffin. Chris is a female knight dealing with your typical sexist bullshit and their lives cross paths. I had never heard of this series, and I was pleasantly surprised to have enjoyed it. It opens with a hunting scene, which I could have lived without, but other than that, it's pretty good and I would recommend. Number 14, The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins, which I gave 4 out of 5. After falling in love with the prequel, I wanted to reread the original series. I still had a few chapters left of the prequel at the time of rereading this, but my brain is all over the place and I just follow it where it goes. I think I'm liking this series more now than I did when I first read it. I still hate all the hunting scenes, but I love the rest. For the 0.001% of you that don't know of the series, a group of 24 children are put into an arena to fight to the death until there is one victor. I will never understand why this is even considered a young adult series. 
The game makers allow for two victors this year, as long as they come from the same district, so Peta and Katniss team up and win together, making some enemies in the capital along the way. It's a heart-wrenching story, and I just love it. Downsides are all the hunting, and also the overly descriptive eating scenes. Those always feel so over the top to me in books. When someone is starving and they don't get food, and they describe every detail of it. Maybe once, but when it's talked about so much in the book, it just annoys me. But it is called The Hunger Games, so what did I expect? I guess maybe more focus on the hunger itself and less on the filling up. I'm just nitpicking though. It's a great book and series, and I love the movies too. I recommend all of them. Number 15, Sukoden 3, The Successor of Fate, Volume 2, by Aki Shimizu. I gave 4 out of 5. Everyone visits a village called the Grasslands, and the boy and the lady knight almost kill each other. Still good, and still recommend. Number 16, Sukoden 3, The Successor of Fate, Volume 3, by Aki Shimizu. I rated 4 out of 5. Some more people team up to find the flame champion. Number 17, Sukoden 3, The Successor of Fate, Volume 4, by Aki Shimizu. I gave 3 out of 5. I'm so bad at keeping track of all the characters, but Hugo is offered the title of being the new flame champion in order to save the grasslands, but some people step in to try and stop him. I dog this one one star because there was a war battle with horses, and I just hate the treatment of horses. Leave them be. Number 18, Sukoden 3, The Successor of Fate, Volume 5, by Aki Shimizu. I gave 3.5 out of 5. Hugo officially becomes the flame champion while everyone tries to figure out if it's real or not. They go for the horses again, so not one of the better volumes. 19, Sukoden 3, The Successor of Fate, Volume 6, by Aki Shimizu. I gave 4 out of 5. Hugo is getting used to his new title and Lady Chris reunited with her father that she thought was dead. Number 20, Sukoden 3, The Successor of Fate, Volume 7, by Aki Shimizu. I gave 4 out of 5. Everyone's coming after Hugo, the fire champion. Number 23, Sukoden 3, The Successor of Fate, Volume 8, by Aki Shimizu. I gave 4 out of 5. Lady Chris tried telling Hugo that Jimba is her father. Number 22, Sukoden 3, The Successor of Fate, Volume 9, by Aki Shimizu. I gave 4 out of 5. This one felt more random than the others. Someone is trying to steal Hugo's fire champion powers, there's a lot of war, someone defends their dragon in not being a pet, and there's peeping at a spa. It's all over the place, but I still enjoyed it. Could have lived without the spa scene, though. What did that even do for the plot? Number 23, Sukoden 3, The Successor of Fate, Volume 10, by Aki Shimizu. I gave 4 out of 5. Hugo is losing his powers, and people are coming after him while other people are trying to protect him. Lady Chris thought her father was dead, but the book ends with the cliffhanger of her seeing him. Number 24, Sukoden 3, The Successor of Fate, Volume 11, by Aki Shimizu. I gave 4.5 out of 5. This is the finale of the series, and I think they wrap things up really well. Hugo earned his title, and the grasslands are safe. The cliffhanger from the previous volume was just an illusion, and Lady Chris handled it fairly well. I think the only thing that I don't like about this volume is that when it flashes forward a year, Lady Chris is struggling in a dress. Just because the war is over doesn't mean she needs to be in a dress. I still really enjoyed the series overall though and would recommend it. Number 25, 26, 27, and 28, Tiger and Bunny Comic Anthology Volumes 1-4. through 4. I gave 3 out of 5. I forgot to log each of these in between, but my views on them stay pretty regular throughout, so I'm just going to clump them together. This is a collection of short stories with the characters from the anime. I like the pacing, but I don't think I like these characters. Tiger is kind of a whore and has a daughter, which is a gross combination, and everyone is always talking about who's hot, and there's a weirdly large amount focused on eating and body image. It's okay though, I wouldn't recommend running out to buy it, but it's not a terrible read. Number 29, Catching Fire by Suzanne Collins. I gave 4.75 out of 5. The second of the Hunger Games series. This installment is just as amazing as I remembered it being. I'd give it a 10 out of 5 if there wasn't any hunting in it. Katniss and Peeta have to go to the Hunger Games again with only previous victors. They are removed from the games during a rebellion they know nothing of, and Katniss wakes up thinking everyone has betrayed her, but Hamish explains the rebel plans and how she's become their mascot, but also tells her that Peta has been captured by the capital. 
This book has been logged nearly 4 million times on Goodreads, so you probably knew that, but there you go. Definitely recommend reading it. Number 30, The Unwritten, Volume 1, Tommy Taylor and the Bogus Identity, by Mike Carey. I gave 4 out of 5. Tom Taylor is the son of the deceased author who wrote a book series about a wizard named Tommy Taylor. People start realizing that Tom's existence doesn't really match up with him as a real person, so everyone thinks he's the actual character. It's a really interesting story. I recommend it and look forward to reading further into the series. Number 31, Mockingjay by Suzanne Collins. I gave 3 out of 5. Rereading this one was the biggest shock in the series. Was Philip Seymour Hoffman's character even in this book? Was that black goo in here? I just read this and I feel like I must be forgetting things or they really changed it a lot. Effie is only in the book at the end. It's the whole beauty team that's in here throughout. They think Effie is dead most of the time, but in the movies, part one and two, she's in the bunker with everyone. During Snow's assassination, he's tied to a post, but in here, he's just casually sitting next to Coin. And doesn't Katniss sneakily kill him here? In the movie, she's walked in to do that in like a whole ceremony scene. I just hate disrespecting the source material. To quickly wrap up the plot, Everyone is hiding in District 13, where it's just a new form of the capital treatment. They make stupid videos to inspire the districts to rebel, which somehow works. Eventually, they rescue the remaining victors from the capital, only PETA has been hijacked, aka brainwashed, into thinking Katniss is evil and he strangles her. They eventually undo it, but it takes time. There's a moment between him and Gail where they're like, I guess we'll see who she picks after the war, but then Gail kind of accidentally kills her sister Prim. I read a review calling him the Prim Reaper, and I laughed way too hard. I read another that said, when you're trying to choose between two guys, but one of them accidentally kills your sister. Read the reviews of the movie of this on Letterboxd the next time you're down. I should check the Goodreads reviews too and see if they're as good. Katniss and Peeta end up together in the end. Gale doesn't even try anything. He just dips off to another district, knowing that he'll never shake off his Prim Reaper title. Katniss's mom also stays away to be a doctor elsewhere. When one of your children dies, shouldn't you maybe try to stay close to your living child? I guess their relationship was backwards anyway. This book was good, but I think I gave it a mediocre rating, mostly because I hated the cringy promotional videos so much, and I hate the word propo. I don't know why, but that word was killing me the entire time. Number 32, The Unwritten, Volume 2, Inside Man, by Mike Carey, which I gave 3.5 out of 5. In this volume, Tom starts realizing that he might actually be Tommy from the book series. The woman who outed him is now sort of helping him. Some children are obsessed with the books and play with the spells. There's an online article in the book of a mom saying her daughter had taken pictures with Tom Taylor before, and now he's being tried for murder, so that makes the picture like rape. Excuse me, how in the hell did you end up there? I think that was supposed to be ridiculous, but I could see people actually saying that. The book closes with an off-shoot story of a grown-up, grumpy, 100-acre woods parody with a grumpy rabbit who keeps threatening to kill all the animals, and he tries to escape the woods. I don't know if that was supposed to be part of the series or an introduction to a different one, but I hope I don't come across any more of that story. Number 33, The Unwritten, Volume 3, Dead Man's Knock by Mike Carey. I gave 4 out of 5. This one kept losing my interest and regaining it. Tom's dad, aka the book author, is murdered by unwritten characters. Lizzie and Tom meet their other selves. There's a section of this book that's set up like a choose-your-own-adventure, but there's no choosing anything. It just makes you flip back and forth for no reason. I don't understand the decision to format that part like that, but overall, the story in this volume was good, and I would recommend this. Number 34, The Unwritten, Tommy Taylor and the Ship That Sank Twice by Mike Carey. I gave 4 out of 5. Here we have the prequel when Tom was a baby and up to his teen years. It covers when his dad was writing the first few books of the series. This is the first of the unwritten series that I've read that made me think I'd actually want to read the Tommy Taylor book series itself. Number 35, Pretty Boys Are Poisonous by Megan Fox. I gave 3.5 out of 5. This book confuses me a lot because as I read it, it felt like a diary. It was a very familiar feeling, and it sounded as if it was written during those days of abuse. 
It all reads very fresh, and all of the details and descriptors sound exactly like Machine Gun Kelly. But I read that she says it's absolutely not about him and that he helped her through it. There's an interview of her saying how she had pictured MGK her whole life and fell madly in love when she found him. And she describes that exact thing in this book in reference to the abuser that she's talking about. Also, she was in a relationship with Brian who doesn't fit any of the descriptors of the abuser and she was with him for 16 years starting when she was 18. Yes, you can be in an abusive relationship when you're a teenager. This definitely reads like it's more fresh. I recently saw them get paparazzi together, so if she's still with him, I understand that it's not safe to say it's really about him. And who knows, maybe it's really not. I just sincerely hope that she's okay and finds true peace and happiness. Number 36, Heartstopper Volume 5 by Alice Osman. I gave 4 out of 5. This was originally supposed to be the final book of the series, but now Volume 6 is supposed to be. In this one, Nick is visiting unis and trying to decide his future, and he and Charlie together start exploring each other more sexually. They're pretty supportive and good with each other, but the other characters are becoming really triggering for me. As someone who studied mental health extensively, I hate any one-size-fits-all healthy claims. It's impossible for one thing to be healthy for everyone. A lot of people in this are pushing the main couple apart and saying that they have to have space and not everyone needs space. Some couples are best without it. And I think we all need to respect the amount of space one couple needs isn't the amount of space another will need. All that matters is that the people in the relationship truly agree on the level of space. If you want to be with your partner 24-7 and they also do, then do that. It's perfectly healthy and you're great. If you and your partner only want to spend one day together a week, then do that. Do what works for you. The only thing that is unhealthy is when both parties don't agree and someone tries to force it on the other person. No one should have to sacrifice their comfort. There's also a comment on asexuality that I disagree with, and it wasn't even how the character felt. It's something that's mentioned as a thing sometimes, and it triggers me to no end. I won't even say it here but it's really putting a damper on this series for me, which sucks because I had loved it so much. Number 37, Not My Father's Son by Alan Cumming. I gave four out of five. The more I read autobiographies, the weirder it gets rating them, as if I'm rating their life and traumas. That aside, this book focuses on Alan's abuse from his father. As someone with a mentally abusive mother, this was really hard for me to get through, but also really touching. Towards the end, he says that he forgives his father, and I know some people say that you have to forgive for yourself to be able to heal, and I'm here to say that you do not have to. You can heal and grow and move on without forgiving your abuser. Never feel like you need to forgive someone who hurt you. Don't dwell on it, but you don't have to forgive them. You can heal without forgiveness. I felt like that was important to add. I do recommend reading this. Number 38, Solitaire, Volume 0.5, This Winter, a Heartstopper Novella by Alice Osman. I gave 4 out of 5. I'm not familiar with the Solitaire series, and I'm wondering if it's connected to the Heartstopper series, because this one definitely is. This takes place on Christmas Day and is broken into three parts, all from the perspective of the spring siblings. It's an interesting read on how everyone affects everyone else. I can't help but feel bad for Charlie, though. He feels like a burden, and this kind of shows that his family feels that he is. I'm so happy that he has Nick and that his family are at least somewhat open to helping. Number 39, Nick and Charlie, a Heartstopper Novella by Alice Osman. I gave 3.5 out of 5. This one was tough. This comes after Volume 5 of Heartstopper, where Charlie tells Nick that he supports him going to school a four and a half hour drive away. They destroy that support in this. Charlie worries that Nick being so excited for uni means that he's really excited to be rid of him, and instead of talking to Nick about it, he refuses to talk at all, gets shit-faced drunk at a party, cries, and spews out nonsense, and they almost kind of break up for two weeks. It's so sad that they didn't even talk about it in those two weeks. They both just cry about it, and when they decide to talk about it, they waste more time and plan a big gesture, which leaves the other one feeling awful for longer. Just talk about it, boys. It ends with them saying they'll stay together and be better than ever, but damn. Charlie is really showing his lack of communication skills here, and I hope he fixes that before the finale. 
Number 40, Fight Club 3 by Chuck Palahniuk. I gave 1 out of 5. I feel like a full star on this one is being generous. Fight Club is obviously his most successful book. A while back, he made a sequel in the graphic novel format, and I loved it. I may need to reread it. When I logged this on Goodreads, I had read a few other people's reviews, and they said that part two was more disgusting, but this one revolted me, so I'm not sure how that's possible. I don't remember the second one being gross at all, but I had a stank face on the entire time I was reading this. In this volume, people are recruiting people to seduce other people and recruit them, and eventually all of those branch off until it hits one million people tied to each person. And I think it's supposed to save them in a way, but if you have to make your sexual web up to a million people, you're fucked either way in multiple ways. I am very disappointed in this and will never, never, never recommend it. Number 41, Tommy's Tale by Alan Cumming. I gave 0 out of 5. Another overly sexualized one that I would not recommend. This is a fiction novel that Alan Cumming wrote, and it is so raunchy and disgusting that I'm surprised I was able to finish it. It's about a 29-year-old man-child who wants to go get drunk all the time and fuck everyone, but gets overly attached to one of his fuck buddy's kids and decides he wants his own. When that man tells him he loves him, Tommy and he have unprotected sex and supposedly make up. He promises to be there for the man's kid, but then he goes and fucks his ex and gets her pregnant. It's fucking disgusting. The only thing I liked about this book is that Tommy's character acknowledges that his sexual deviance is because he's super fucked up in the head and that he doesn't want to be that way. But he is and I need to vomit now. Number 42, The Electric State by Simon Stallenhag. I gave 3.5 out of 5. A dystopian novel about a teen girl who is traveling around. There's robots in danger. I don't know about this because I liked it, but it seemed like I was missing chapters and then the book just cuts off. Maybe I didn't get the format. I guess I would recommend it. Maybe you'll have a better luck piecing it together than I did. Supposedly there will be a movie, but the rights for it were bought in 2017, so we'll see. That's all 42 books I read in January. I think this will be the most for any other month this year. We shall see, though. You never know. One of these days, I will hop back on my Hallmark binge and my books will get dusty again. That's all for now, though. Bye!